I send my greetings to the church in Utrecht, to you, dear brothers and sisters. And as usual, I am only sad that I cannot speak more Afrikaans or have not troubled myself to speak the language. For if I worked harder at it, I would get it. But I will explain tonight why I don't work harder to get it. I do work, but I don't work harder for the reason that I'm going to explain tonight. And if I haven't convinced you tonight, you tell me. Maybe I need to work harder at Afrikaans. But tonight's message is why I'm not. And it's from the book of 1 Peter. So if you can open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter. Ian Petrus, chapter 1 and verse 18. And as you are turning there, I have this unusual difficulty, and that is that I would prefer to open the Bible and tell you what God said and then have fulfilled my duty. But I occupy the, the role of being a missionary or a church planter, which means that I have the delightful but distracting job of telling you about myself and our ministry and the works of God and the answers to your prayers. And it is difficult for a speaker to blend two themes and bring about a unified result. That is, I have to tell you about what's happening and tell you about what's written, but I'm going to try. So let me say by beginning, if I have not had the pleasure of meeting you as I just met Joshua and, oh no, is it Marlene? Marne. Marne. And Alika? And Marguerite? How to say? Marguerite and Joshua Jr. and Misha. Good to meet you all. And Greg and Aaron and this other gentleman. <laughs> I'm glad, to, I'm glad to meet you, and mostly I rejoice not only for the Lord's Day meetings, but the last time I was privileged to worship with you, I was here on a Wednesday evening for the time of prayer. And it is common that the prayer meetings in many churches are disinterested, that few people attend, that the prayers are cold, stale, and short. I rejoiced to hear that it was otherwise here. And even when the pastor, don't say the domini, was gone, that you still met and were so zealous. If you don't come, you are depriving yourself. But for those who were here, you strengthened my faith and encouraged me. And I believe that you do pray and are praying and are praying for us and for others and God is answering you. So let me tell you, how the Lord has been answering some of your prayers. I'm a church planter among the Tsongas, the Shangans. There are approximately three million in South Africa. Another three million if you cross over into Mozambique. And while we are here, our goal is to produce selfish churches. One, two, three. Self-supporting, self-propagating, self-governing. I'm sorry, but I know you're good at angles. You know those words. Let me help you. Please pardon me for having to use such a barbaric language as English. Self-governing. That means we want to plant churches where the people in the church make the decisions. The decisions aren't made outside and pushed on the church. Number two, self-propagating. Ooh, that word. You know propagate because you're all good with bluma. You have beautiful trees and gardens, and you know what it is to propagate a lychee tree. Oh, I did that one wrong. It doesn't bear fruit. We want to propagate and plant churches that produce other little churches without me there. That is, if I've done my job well when I'm done, then the church should reproduce itself. And thirdly, self-supporting. Churches that support themselves. They're not dependent on money outside their culture or outside their geography or outside their own people group. So our goal is to have selfish churches, three selves. There will be a quiz, Misha. You'll need to know it. Sunay, I hope you're taking notes. 
And you need to, as a church, support churches that are that way because I didn't make that up. That's from Acts 13 to 21, which I preached on the last time. I'm sure Rolf remembers that sermon. Where I tried to explain Acts 13 to 21 and how Paul planted churches that were selfish in that regard. We're trying to do that. Paul Schleinlein is trying to do that. And so over the last 16 years, we've had the joy of seeing the Elam Baptist Church come from nothing, ex nihilo. And now there are about 30 believers that meet at that building and worship the Lord under the pastorship of Alpheus Nyalungu, a Tsonga man led to Christ and ordained under our ministry. And now that church is selfish and we don't attend there anymore. Down the road is Trinity Baptist Church where Paul is laboring. He's laboring to find a man, to pull some man out of a village where all the good men come here. I mean, this greater area where there's jobs and money and opportunity so you don't have to live in the rural places. Paul's planting that in Bakota, about 10 kilometers away, 7 to 10 kilometers away. Past Bakota is Mashamba, where there is a selfish church. Mashamba Baptist Church. Now we're working in the village of Valdesia. And we have five believers there. Sean saw it. I was very glad that he said he was coming back again. Is it next week or the week after? So it's good that... Sean saw that little ministry there, and we've been laboring for over five years. We have five believers and another five to ten who come most Sundays. I hope they came. In fact, if you heard my phone ring, I think that was one of the men telling me how the services went today. And so we're laboring to plant another church there. Over the years that we have been working, Paul and I, we started a little Bible college, and from that college, it's now basically gone. We still have evening classes. But from that college, four graduates are still serving the Lord in Zimbabwe. From those four, there are three new Christ-centered biblical churches. There was down the road, another hour away from us, a Tsonga man who was caught in prosperity theology. But by amazing grace, his eyes have been slowly awakened. He's been coming out. He and I met a few years ago. And we've been meeting about twice a month. And his church is slowly coming out of prosperity theology and almost, almost ready to begin true biblical membership. And we hope to see another church planted there in the village of Jimmy Jones. It's okay to laugh at that name. Who would name their town Jimmy Jones? But that's not as bad as where we're working. We're working in the village of Sodom. Yes, from Genesis 19. So that's where we're laboring and some of the fruits that God has given over many years. Our tools to accomplish this are door-to-door -door Bible studies, street preaching, children's Bible clubs, repeating Bible studies in the afternoon, youth groups on Thursday and Friday, Bible sales, tract distribution, and Sunday services. You heard what we said. We did not say, what we're doing is giving out blankets. We make up care packages and hand out 100 bags of mealy every Saturday. That might be well enough and there might be some good to that and some need for that. That's not what the Apostle Paul did. But since you all remember that sermon the previous time, I won't re-preach that, right? And so that's our labor. And we ask you to join us in prayer. Should I lower that a little? We ask you to join us in prayer and continue praying that God would have mercy on the Tsongas, the poor, forgotten, ignored, and neglected Tsonga people. They're not the only neglected, but they are. And I would like tonight to present you with two worlds in South Africa. An amazing thing happened, or a surprising thing happened to me when I came to this country. I learned greatly because I was so poorly educated, I didn't know what a Boer was. I thought an Afrikaner was another black language group. I didn't know what, who Mandela was, or what apartheid was. You probably think I'm blessed. 
I had to learn history and culture and geography, but I also learned that there's two worlds in this country. There's a city or an urban area, and there's a rural area. The city areas are largely developed by the wealth produced from Christianity and Christian principles. Yes, there were sins. No one says, there's no society that's perfect, especially since there are so many unconverted people in every country. But the principles of Christianity are why, on Wayne Grudem's book, The Poverty of the Nations, on the cover of that book, he has a map of the world color-coded by wealth. There are four colors on that map. There's green for rich, blue for, po- for moderately rich, brown for poor, and red for dirt poor. And the whole world is squeezed onto the cover of that little book. And I think I've learned just as much from the cover as from many whole books. To look at the cover and to see the world in four colors, green, very rich, blue, rich, brown, poor, and red, Africa is covered with red and brown. But one country stands out, brightly colored as rich. Can you guess what country? You can't guess. It's this blessed land. This country. Why is that, you have to ask yourself? And the unbelieving world will say foolish things. Well, all the resources. Well, all the evils of the past. The repression of the past built this wealth and stole it, and that's why it needs to be redistributed. That's a lot of historic rubbish. Read history. The wealth of this country was created by Christian kinds of principles that were so widespread. I'm not saying all the people were converted, but they were widespread. And so you have pockets of this place where everyone, where Paul lives, they want to come here. A few weeks ago, I told you there were five believers in Valdesia. A few weeks ago, one of them, Langu Mashimze, 21 years old, just left Valdesia, a very poor village, and moved down here. Do you know why? Because there's 40% unemployment where he lives, and it's not quite 40 here yet. And he got a job. I called him last night. He's on the northwest side of Pretoria. And he's getting paid every month. When do you think he's going to go back to our little church plant? It's not on his calendar. So with that said, I want to define the line between developed and rural. I want to give you a definition to define what is a developed area and what is a rural area. Rural is this, few tar roads, few jobs, not much English. Remember those three. You take away the tar roads, then you can't move your trucks quickly. You can't get a lot of products there. You take away the jobs, then the best men leave. You take away the English, it's difficult to communicate across language groups and to learn learn principles and read books and get an education. So when you have an area that is lower in the English tar roads and jobs category, you're probably looking at a rural area. Now when I came here, I told you there was something that was surprising and it was this. I found a surprise, a delightful surprise that there were Afrikaners who had beautiful gardens and ate with a fork and a knife so that it was actually polite instead of this grotesque American kind of stabbing motion. And a good number of other things. The kindness with which I have been almost, not completely, I can give you some very bad examples, but you probably could too, almost universally universal kindness with which I have been received by the Afrikaner people and uh, Afrikaan speaking people. But I learned 
that many Afrikaners don't get angry at me. I'm just telling you the truth. I learned that a great many Afrikaners would talk about what life is like in the rural areas. And I thought to myself, I'm living there, not you. And I speak the language, not you. Do you speak Tonga? Do you speak Venda? Can you speak Shona? Have you been learning it? But I would find that many times, oh, this is the way things are. And I, no, that's very interesting. Where perhaps did you come across this solid rock of knowledge, this confidence that you have? Well, I grew up with them. And yo, oh, I had the maid, I had the this, and I had the experience. Maybe you know some things. I now have learned some things. And I'd like to share them with you tonight. And I'll tell you right now the conclusion. The rural areas of Africa are in desperate need of the Christian gospel because they are almost entirely unchristian. And I heard differently from a good many well-meaning people in cities. Oh, we, we sent missionaries there. We've got schools. Oh, there's a church. We support Fountain of Living Hope Life Church. We support Champions for Christ Living Church. Oh, we built two churches up there. I want tonight to pull back the curtain and show you the kind of Christianity that fills, that saturates the rural areas. And what is rural? Jeanette, help me out with one of the three categories for what a rural area is. I just told you. Help me out. Who can help me? One of the three categories. Little English. Give me another one. Tar roads and... Jo Jobs. Jobs, tar roads, English. Low in those categories. And I want to try, with the little experience I have of a few years and speaking Tsonga and a little Venda and a little Shona, I want to tell you what life is like and I want to stir up your compassion so that when you go to pray, there may be tears in your eyes and God may store those tears in a bottle and say, my people have prayed and I will hear them. Because God may use this church in an unusual way. And he may answer your prayers and send out laborers to the harvest. Send out your young men. Because the number of martyrs is not yet full. With that as a lengthy introduction, I ask you to look tonight at Ian Petrus, chapter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life received by tradition from your ancestors. If you have a pen, you'll want to underline three words. Number one is futile. Useless, worthless. Number two is lifestyle, way of life, culture. Number three is ancestors, forefathers. The rural areas are filled with a religion that is useless, worthless, profitless, because it's a way of life that they did not get from the Bible. They got it from what source? Where does the Bible tell us that they got it from? This is entirely politically incorrect. And if you are afraid of being politically incorrect, you might want to walk out now. But I, I, won't, I won't have you turn to Jeremiah 10 verses 2 and 3 because... In that verse it says, do not learn the culture or the ways of the pagans, of the nations. And the New American Standard Bible says their ways are stupid. That's the word it uses. Their culture is stupid. There are some foolish and backward people today that will actually call you one of these bad words that starts with an R. If you just read Jeremiah 10 verses 2 and 3. If you read Titus chapter 1, which says the Cretans, those people coming from the place called Crete who spoke that particular language, those people are always lazy, evil, gluttons, and liars. 
What would happen today if I said, you know the people over in, and then I name a region or a language group, and I put those kind of words on them? The world outside would say you are. They'll put in these things and try to attack. Why? Paul's not afraid to say that. The book of Samuel, chapter, uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 to 5. Do you remember when Saul was told by Samuel, go and destroy all of the Amalekites, and not just the men, but who else? The women, and not just the women, but who else? Not just the children, but who else? The babies, not just the babies, but what else? And then he lists all the different kinds of animals. He wants to be certain that place was entirely destroyed. And the only way you can explain that is by their culture had been so depraved that it had offended God, and he said, it will not be under my son anymore. Read your Bible. Those kinds of things are throughout the Bible to warn us that there is such a thing as a depraved way of life or lifestyle or culture. It's called in Romans chapter 1, reprobate. John Calvin uses the picture of many people are floating in the boat of their sin down the river of their depravity. But when a man is reprobate, it's as if they are pushed down that river that they might move even more quickly. If you want to ask and answer the question of the poverty in Africa, it comes down to the question of religion. And that's right there in our verse. You were not redeemed by silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's verse 19. From what? From what were you saved? And my dear brothers and sisters, we have accepted a truncated view of sin a weak and petty view of sin because we haven't taken sin seriously in our own lives. We haven't plucked out our eyes when we sin. We haven't cut off our hand when we sin. And so when we look at others, we judge them the same way we've dealt with our own sin. And we say, well, I don't really want to cut off my own hand when I sin. I don't want to deal with my own sin in true biblical repentance. And therefore, when I look at them, I'm going to, okay, I'll, I'll soften my view on them as well. But the Bible does not talk that way. It still has the doctrine of eternal conscious torment. Why? Because God is filled with fury when he looks at sin. Habakkuk 1.13, he is of pure eyes that behold evil, and he cannot look on iniquity. He cannot even look at it. And if we ponder the terror of eternal conscious torment in a literal flame, we will know God's view of sin or even more intensely. Is there anything more intense than the terrible doctrine of the lake of fire? There is, there is one thing more intense. It is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, where God the Father, who had dwelt from eternity past in unbroken joy and fellowship with His Son, and had only enjoyed happiness seeing the infinite beauty of the Son of God, and it's reflected in the Spirit, and there was, if it were possible, an overflowing cataract of joy and happiness between Father, Son, and Spirit. But then on the cross, approximately 2,000 years ago, the Father turned His back on the Son, and all of His unending wrath was, as it were, poured out on the shoulders of the God-man, and He drank that cup to its full for you and for me and for sinners. That's the picture of what sin is. It's the only thing strong enough to somehow rend a tear in the unterrible, to somehow pour out filth on the pure one, to somehow make the prince of joy, the man of sorrows. It was the Father who poured it out on the Son because it pleased Jehovah to crush him. That's what God thinks of sin. And we have some foolish postmodern view of sin taken from the television. And this verse won't allow it. It says up front, I want you to know what your whole lifestyle is like. It's useless. It's worthless. It's profitless. It does nothing. This Greek word in verse 18 
vain or foolish or profitless is the same word used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in the book of what book in the Old Testament uses the word vanity? Do you know it? You can't answer here. Pridakant? Pridakar. Over and over. Vanity, worthless, profitless. Same word. Do you know what your lifestyle is like? It's not a beautiful alternate lifestyle. It's worthless. Do you know? Well, but my culture, my culture. It's worthless, that culture of yours. Well, but we have this and this. Worthless. But we have Coke sisters. Worthless. 1 Peter 1.18 says, A worthless, profitless lifestyle received from our forefathers. With the brief explanation of that one verse, I would like now to get on an airplane and fly over Africa. I hesitate to say Africa as if there's really any unity in this very large land mass. When do you ever hear all the peoples of Eurasia, Europe, putting, talking about their geography? South America, putting South America on t-shirts. There's very little unity in Africa except for the religion that dominates. That's the present tense still dominates. I'd like to fly over Africa and discuss the religion. Deuteronomy 32 verse 17 says, they worshipped demons whom they called gods. Galatians 4 8 says they were slaves to those which are no gods. 1 Corinthians 8 says there are many gods. Let me ask you, how many gods are there? You want to say one. You need to modify it. There's Ian, true God, Varhaid, Varhut, Varhut, Ian Varhut, but there are many Choda, Choda, there are many gods, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 4, and they're demons, John MacArthur famously said, Allah is not a name for God, it's a name for a demon, the gods of the world are idols, and those idols are backed by false spirits. 1 Timothy 4.1, these spirits have doctrines, they have teachings. Revelation 9.20, unbelievers worship demons. Deuteronomy 12.31, they kill their children because they've even defiled mother love. 1 Kings 22, when the king lost his war... He goes out and sacrifices his own son in a depraved and barbaric act, thinking maybe if I murder my children, the demons will help me. Deuteronomy 28, 15, God curses Israel, his own people. And one of the curses in Deuteronomy 28 is by turning them over to false gods. Ephesians 6, 10, we are told that we fight against these demons, these false religions. And he gives them four names, rulers, powers, authorities, principalities, dominions. All over the Bible, the Bible compares false religions to demons. It says they're motivated by demons. And these demonic forces stand behind every false religion. Whether it is Catholicism, Atheism, African traditional religion, Buddhism, animism, secularism, it is, or Islam, it is a demon behind that false religion. And one of those false religions is African traditional religion. Can you click up there? I'd like to talk to you about African traditional religion. Next slide, please. Because, next slide, next slide, let me just pause here and follow my slides, not my notes. When I bring harsh words 
when the Bible brings harsh words and I simply say what it says, it can be mistaken as if we are blind to any good and we don't understand nuance. I've listed up here four marks of common grace in African culture. Raise your hand if you know what common grace is. Who knows what common grace is? You're about to learn. Here it is. Common grace is everything good that doesn't take you to heaven. Are there good things that are good but can't save? Yes. Sleep. Wives. Leeches. Good things, but they can't save you. That's common grace. And every culture has some common grace. Here are four marks. Africans love children. I won't belabor these because I know, already know my time's going to run out, but I could belabor these. I could give examples of these. Africans bear suffering with great patience. I could, again, give many examples of me walking into a post office and the queue is long, and I look and say, ah, sheesh. Hey, hey, is there a guy there? Is anyone working? Hey, guy. And then, hey, hey, calm down, Mlungu. Calm down, Mukua. Relax. They'll come. He doesn't rush. You even got a book with you. Just read. You knew this was coming. That's why he brought the book. Just relax with your book, white guy. And I said, oh, God, da, 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 da. They bear patience. Africans respect each other by agreeing, deferring, and using titles. The deference that I have seen from my African brothers has taught me a number of lessons of humility. Number four, Africans support each other through pain. There is common grace in every culture, but our problem is just what Richard Mao, the president of an apostate seminary in America, said when he was debating a man, a Mennonite, on the co topic of common grace. And here's the one line from this debate that is most vital. Here's what he said. At the end of the debate, the Mennonite looked at Richard Mao, the president of the seminary, and said, I think our difference is this. I view the world as created by God, but fallen into sin. You view the world as fallen into sin, but still created by God. Did you catch the difference? All I did was turn the two. And the difference is one of perspective. Do you look at the world and say, it's a really, really good world? Yeah, there's a few little problems. It's a really good world. Do you tend to say everything's good? Well, I'm an optimist. I like to say everything's good. But the Bible is explicit that the world was created very good, but the fall ruined everything. It put a curse on the earth. Common grace should not be used to overpower the effects of sin. And that is what a great many pastors have done today. And a great many who call themselves Christians, they'll look at something like leeches or some other good, pleasing mark. Oh, look how rich we are. It must be a sign of God's blessing. I just read a book that mentioned that. Look how rich we are. It must be a sign of God's blessing. Look how kind they are to other children. See, that's good. Yes, that's good. But dead dogs have pretty white teeth. Who, who's going to say, well, I, I'll take that dead dog home because his teeth are so white. That's what we do when we praise common grace and culture and ignore what the scripture says about depravity. Next slide. African traditional religion. Let me give you a crash course in theology tonight. And if you say, how does this come from the text? It comes right here. Useless way of life received from the ancestors. I'm trying to teach you what life is like behind the rural areas or in the rural areas marked by those three things. Who can tell me what they are? What are the three marks of the rural areas? Who can tell me? Bad roads, jobs, English. When you go into a place like that, you immediately know, hey, it's different here, it's different. It's dominated by a religion. Here's the tenets, the main beliefs of African traditional religion, which I'll just call ATR. Number one, there are many gods. This is the fundamental principle of ATR. In ATR, there are gods equal to the number of dead people. Because every time someone dies, they become a god. The Tsonga word for god, what is it, Colin? Say it loudly, we can't even hear you. Did you hear him? Didn't even hear the guy. Speak up, please. Yeah, I hope wake you up too. Shikwembu. Shikwembu is a dead 
person's spirit that now lives somewhere there or here. When the Swiss missionaries came to translate the Bible into Tsonga, they had to deal with that word, shikwembu, which means a departed spirit. What do we do because we have no word for the one great spirit? What would you do? They chose to put the word shikwembu in the Bible for every time it says God. Don't act shocked. It's in all the African language translations. Uh, Chivenda is mudzimu. What is a mudzimu? It's a departed spirit. Sutra is mudimu. What is a mudimu? It's a departed spirit. And there's many, many, many of them in the African worldview, in the worldview of ATR. So taught into their minds from an early age is the idea that when we die, we go into some cloudy area that's here and not here, and close and not close, and able to speak to us but not see us, and talk, touch us, and it's completely unknowable. That's the third bullet. Ultimately unknowable. They're always moving, they're always doing something, but we cannot know. It's not possible to have certainty. What does that do to your epistemology? Epistemology is a big word meaning, how do you know what you know? Epistemology is the science of knowing. Their epistemology is absolutely without certainty, which is why there's no word for certainty in Sangha or Venda. You can't say, I'm certain. You know what you say in Sangha? Nishur. Sure, English sure, and you put ni at the beginning. I, I'm sure. Because you don't have a concept for that. You can't say certain in Sangha because their worldview doesn't allow for certainty. Why not? Because whatever this spirit did today, he might get tired of doing it and might go home, and that spirit might do the exact opposite. You, got, you, you, you dropped your phone today and it went down because that spirit, but tomorrow you drop it and the spirit might take it up. How can you ever tell what's going to happen? Someone might die of malaria today, but why bother writing down what happens and recording it and trying different chemicals because another spirit might change it tomorrow, which is why a nurse died in our village and I preached at the funeral, not in our church. She had been to a college and received a degree, but when she caught malaria, she went to the Sangoma for so many weeks that it reached inside her and she was uncurable so that when she went to the doctor he said why didn't you come you get a test I know why she didn't come because she had a degree but she still had that religion guiding her and she died at a young age and left children and at the funeral though they promised me they would not do anything from African traditional religion, they picked up the box with the woman inside it and brought her little toddler and waved the toddler underneath. And I say, no, you can't do that. Later I ask, why wave the toddler? And do you know what they said? Who can guess what they said? It's really simple, you could guess. They said, we don't know. Everyone does different things. I said, did they do that because they were afraid or because they wanted to protect the child? Oh yes, I already knew that. So they waved the body of the child under the casket to protect it. But why did they do it? They don't know. No one else knows. Everyone does something different. Well, why not? Because they're unknowable. They're arbitrary. Who knows? Two plus two is four, or maybe six, or maybe ten. Which is why last week in Oregon, United States, a teacher's union said math is racist. We're not going to allow math to be taught in the same way. We're going to show how math is actually a form of white supremacy. What they really mean is this. The principles behind math require an absolute mind who never changes. And because we despise that one absolute mind who never changes, and because we hate his son who came to live and die for sinners, and because we will not put ourselves under his rule, we're going to say that math is racist and make ourselves the laughing stock of everyone who can say two plus two is four. African traditional religion is uniquely used by Satan. It produces poverty. It is the religion that produces poverty, not the other way around. It is the religion that produces poverty, not, as some people would say, colonialism, not government politics. It was not some previously disadvantaged no. Why is it that from the 1940s to the 1990s, there was higher immigration into this country than out of this country from those with dark skin? 
There may have been injustices, there may have been sins, but there were free choices to say, I'm going to come. Why? Because they knew there's something in Johannesburg that keeps, it's a tree that keeps bringing fruit. It keeps making wealth. I want that. I really want to buy phones. I want to have a car. I want to have clothes. I want to have these things. And what I'm in is not producing it. Which is why there's a flood of immigration. Even during a time of injustice. The religion produces poverty. And that's why when my dear brother Paul wrote a blog post, which you all need to go read, search Paul Schleyline, Reasons for Poverty in the Rural Areas. When he wrote that about three years ago, and he included 14 reasons for poverty in the rural areas, and he did not include a political system that lasted for about 40 years. He didn't include that as one of the 14 reasons for poverty. And when he wrote that article, a lot of people pushed back and said, you've got to change it, change it, change it. And I just love Paul Schleyline. He said, change? I don't even know the meaning of the word. And he left it up, and he was exactly right. The reason for the poverty is some kinds of sins. It's religious. Those may not be the only reasons for poverty, but they are the dominant reasons for poverty. In fact, another man, a lecturer in a Bible college, taught there are only, there is only one reason for poverty, and it is sin. Either your own sin, or the sin of the government, or the sin of criminals, or the sin of other citizens, which makes them criminals. The only reason for poverty is my sin, the government's sin, or the criminal's sin. Those are the only reasons for poverty. If you took away all of your sin, and the government was not sinfully taking your wealth, or infringing upon your freedoms... And if criminals did not threaten you or take away your wealth by forcing you to put up palisades and motors and then locks on your motors, if they didn't force you to waste your 500 rand in that way, you'd be able to put your 500 rand to better use and maybe hire a few more people. But if, if it wasn't stopped by sin, there would be wealth. That religion promotes sin, and so that religion is the cause, ultimately, of poverty ATR promotes ignorance. That second bullet on the right is similar to the third bullet on the left and the fourth bullet. It promotes ignorance because you cannot know something. You cannot have a basis for science. What is science but we try a test today, we write down what we tried and what happened. Then tomorrow we try a test changing just a little. You write it down. Why write anything down if the results of your test were controlled by the changeful spirits. If that's the real reason for the problem, then you can never know anything. Your epistemology is an absolutely hopeless, lost ocean. You are lost on an ocean, epistemological ocean, where you can never come to the shore. ATR prohibits art. Because of African traditional religion, there is no striving upward for beauty or glory because none of their shikwembu, none of those spirits, none of those mizimu, none of those modimu, none of those departed spirits are spirits of beauty. In fact, in my entire time ministering and working, I have asked many, are there any departed spirits, are there any sangomas who do something positive or is it all protecting, putting up a wall from the people who are trying to do bad? I have never found a sangoma who says, oh, I call the good spirits. These spirits will bless you. It's always, oh, I can put up some wall to protect you from the bad spirits hurting you. Where are the good spirits? You see, there's only good spirits here. Read Greek mythology. They might be good for a day. They switch the next day. The good spirit is here. This is the only revelation that has a consistent, defensible explanation for just, holy, righteous, generous, gracious spirit and his angels under him. Next slide. It contrasts with Christianity because it is godless. There is no glorious trinity. It contrasts with Christianity because it is lawless. There's no written law. Imagine that, living life without a written law. And maybe you can understand why some people don't pay such attention to traffic laws. 
Because if you have a religion that says written laws are for someone else's world, maybe you don't care so much about written laws. Maybe you don't mind bending the laws if you're in parliament because laws are meant to be bent, right? That's what my religion tells me. It's purposeless. There's no divine purpose to the world. Why? Because the spirits are arbitrary. It's distinctionless. There's no word for distinction in Sangha. There's no word for purpose. There's no clear difference between the creature and the creator. Did you see that? Because in Sangha culture, what is the Shikwembu? Where does the Shikwembu come from? Dead people, you and me. We will become the gods according to their worldview. When we die, we are God. So there's no line between that's God and that's not God. But in the real world, in the real world, there is a clear line. There's a God and it's not me. Which is why the prosperity gospel fits so well with African traditional religion. Because the prosperity gospel says, speak faith, speak faith, speak faith. And it's why you should never, even for a moment, watch these charlatans like Joseph Prince, unless you're trying to get ammunition to throw down his wicked false doctrines and demonic teachings. These men are borrowing a page from African traditional religion, these false prosperity preachers. It's crossless. There's no atonement for sin. What a hopeless religion, which is why their funerals are miserable. I've been to many. The funerals are so hopeless. Why wouldn't they be hopeless? There's no atonement for sin. There's no removing of guilt. You know in your heart because the law is written in there. But when I die, I'm going to some place of which I'm not certain. I keep saying there's Shikwembu, but in my heart, I don't believe it. In my heart, as Ray Comfort says, all men believe in God. God doesn't believe in atheists. Romans 1, verse 21. Men knew God, but they did not glorify Him as God. They know there's a God, and their funerals will tear your heart out if you have any Christian compassion in you. And I have been to many of them. Hopeless, purposeless, crossless, judgmentless. There's no eternal wrath for sinners. What would you do if you were a 19-year-old boy and you were really angry and you thought, there's no judgment at all? There's no judgment at all. What do you think a 19-year-old boy might be led to do? What do you think a group, a whole population segment? What do you think if there were 5 million, 10 million, 20, 25 million from 19 to 28 spread out over a country and they thought to themselves, no matter what I do, I'll never pay a price for it. Worst they can do is put me in a prison where there's basketball and, and tennis courts and I get three meals a day. And then I die and there's nothing else. Hopeless. There's no hope, even for the most devout followers. You do everything just right and you can never know that it's been enough. Next slide. But now I want to transition and say everything I... Go back one slide. Everyone's looking at this one. Everything I've said has been about what? ATR, African traditional religion. Or what 1 Peter 1 said, your useless way of life that you received from who? The forefathers, the ancestors. But now, I want to jump into the 21st century because in the 21st century, we have 37,000 church, Patrick Johnstone records in his 2010 edition of Operation World. 37,000 churches? That's a lot of churches. Not really if you divide by 56 million. 37,000 churches? Yes, yeah, spread them out of the country and let's see what kind they are. Next slide. Notice this. Now, you can't see this. Can you cut the lights off up front? Notice this and let's try to exegete this picture, okay? When we come to the Bible, we want to exegete the Bible. Let's exegete the picture. Look up here at the picture and first of all, the first thing we're going to notice is what everyone notices. We notice people. You always notice people before words. Don't try to pretend you're intellectual. Everyone notices people before words, which is why they put people on every advertisement. Look at the people here and what do the people tell you? First of all, it's a man and a woman. Can't forget the woman because she's holding the mic. She's not in the worship team only. She's part of the preaching staff. Wait, I thought the Bible said, ha ah, ha, we don't worry about written laws. Notice that you can't see it very clearly, but I'll tell you. This is a bumper sticker, and in that bumper sticker, the woman has multiple gold rings that she is making sure are all visible. There's also a gold watch that is visible on the woman. She has a very expensive dress. The man has a suit with different colored lapels from the suit so that you can be sure he's wearing an expensive suit. He also has a ring that's visible. 
cufflinks that are visible and a pin that's visible as much metal to try to hint that he's rich. Also, see how his fingers, he knows what he's talking about. You can trust any man who speaks like this. Just ask Bill Clinton. And then here's their theology. 2016, the year of fulfillment. Fulfilling what? Prosperity theology loves vague statements because African traditional religion loves vague statements. Unclear. Remember, African traditional religion does not have anything to do with certainty. There's no word in Sangha for define or definition. The word, the Tsonga word for dictionary is dikishinari. There's no word for these things because those aren't important to the African traditional religion. That religion doesn't care about making clear definitions. It doesn't care about having, prior, there's no word for priority, logical, clear, precise, definite, none of those words. You can't say those concepts in Sangha. So up here we've got the year of fulfillment, vague, something good though. Underneath that, I am a wonder, completely taking Psalm 71 out of context. And especially since the word wonder there is from the King James translation, which actually means uh, so, such terrible things are happening to me. Everyone looks at me and says, oh, look at what's happening to him. Next slide. Agape City, see if you can read this. Deliverance and Healing Ministry, look at the one that my finger is on there. Agape City 2016, the year of God to match the standard. Believe it, pray about it, speak it, keep it slash grab it, run with it, release it. Thank you for laughing. You all should be laughing. That's ridiculous. That's, that's utterly ridiculous. It's ridiculous syntax. It's stupid uh, uh, subjects and verbs. What does this mean? Can you imagine the Apostle Paul writing like that? It's lunacy. It's childish. That's published. Next slide. Prosperity Gospel. That's T.B. Joshua, very famous man from Nigeria. He has millions and millions of U.S. dollars. And on the left-hand side, you see a box, the front and the back. The front of the box says anointing water and has a cross. Underneath that, it says, maybe you can't see it. I'll read it to you. The blood of Jesus sets you free from sickness Sin, sickness, and hardship as you minister it in Jesus' name. That's on the front of the box, that one with the cross. Uh, so, anointing water. You see the anointing water at the top? And the implication is, this is the blood of Jesus inside. That's what it says. The blood of Jesus sets you free. That's written on the bottom. On the back of the box, we have the wounds of our Lord Jesus falling as drops of blood, but changing into drops of water, falling into a pool of water, of which the title is called the blood of Jesus. And underneath that, you can't see it, it says for the salvation of your soul. What message is sent by that? You buy his water, your soul is saved. You buy his water, you're free from sin and sickness. Of course, he prophesied back in 2016 that Hillary Clinton would be president, of which no matter what has happened in recent days, I can always praise God that that prophecy will never come true. He's a false prophet. Next slide. Bushiri's anointed. How many of you know Bushiri? This wicked false prophet who leaves one of the top ten poorest countries in the world, Malawi, to come to the richest country in Africa, South Africa, and within Africa, does he go to Brackpan? Where does he go to live? Does he say, you know, I think I'm going to make my home in Tembisa? He didn't. Where does he live? Sant lived before he was caught for money laundering. He lived in Santon. The richest place in the continent. What a filthy, blasphemous liar he is to put on his bottles of oil the Lion of Judah, which our pastor prayed for tonight. He puts the picture of the lion and his own filthy smile beside it. Peter has words for men like that in his second letter, chapter 2, when he calls them filthy dreamers. For whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Next picture. Here's 2010 Financial Prosperity Conference. You, of course, notice, if you want to take time to look at this gentleman, he's very successful, right? And if you come to this conference, you'll be just like him. He has this beautiful suit on with the lapel. But down at the bottom, you can't see sitting back in the cheap seats. But right here, you see there's a verse right at the bottom. Can you see that verse? We'd like to see what it says, right? Sunay, would you like to read that verse? Next slide, please. Let's just read this verse here. Can anyone see that verse? See it? Do you want me to read? Joshua, can you read that verse? Is that too far back? Do you want to try to read that verse? Yeah. 
Now, you missed one thing. He missed one thing. He missed the quote mark. Does everyone, can you see the quote mark after the word wealthy and the quote mark before the word Jesus? Tell me, what do quote marks mean? You're quoting, you're taking the exact words of the source. How many of you know John 3, 16? Is that it? This is the religion. This is not one church or two church. This is all the churches. When I say all, I mean all the way the Bible commonly uses all. I'm not saying every single. Maybe there are a very few. We have tried to plant seven. And we hope the Lord will let us get 50, 100, 200, if God would be gracious. But among the 56 million, for all purposes, we can say all. 99%. Next picture. Look at this man. Christ to preach in hell. Christ will preach in hell from 130 to July 2017. Many people will be moved from hell to heaven. What will be the effect of men there? They won't evangelize. It will be just like Johannes Tetzel before the, the German Re uh, Reformation. When he came in saying, give us some money, give us some money. We'll get all your people, all your relatives out of hell. Look what he says. Pray that your relatives will be removed from hell. And there was a, an offering taken. Oh, they're going to terrify people. Everyone's crying in hell. Give us money. Give us money. The more money, the more confident that you can be. What a wicked, blasphemous thing to say. This is the Christianity that's happening in the rural areas marked by three things. Few jobs, few tar roads, and little English. Next slide. Look at this. Freedom at last. Judgment night two. That alone is blasphemous. How many times did Christ die in the book of Hebrews? Once at the end of the world. He died for sinners. But this is judgment night number... Number two, because these people say that Christ's finished work was insufficient because they really care nothing for Christ. They care nothing for heaven. They would be glad to go to heaven if Christ weren't there, and it would be a hell to them if he were there. Judgment night two. Look in the far right. I'll read it for you. The top words. Bring any situation and watch as God judges. Now look underneath that at what God, quote, judges at their conference. Poverty, lack, Sickness, disease, barrenness. Notice this, poverty, pretty vague. Lack, even more vague. Sickness, anytime you don't feel good. Disease, barrenness. These people have no concern about saving souls from hell, removing the wrath of God, removing the guilt of sin. They care nothing for this, only to take a big offering. Next picture. And this is from a Sangoma. This is a witch doctor. What does he offer? Powerful Sangoma. These pictures are all over Louis Tricard and all over the northern province and all over the rural areas. What does he offer? Future, career, family, home, uh, security, love, health. Stop crying and be loved. Bring back your lost lover. Magic ring. This is what's offered at the Sangoma. Can you see any difference between African traditional religion offering and what they offer? The prosperity gospel. Next, pay, next paragraph. Now we come to the whole point, and I come to the conclusion. The rural areas of the world. Look in the far left. You see region, country, world, Africa, East Africa, West Africa, etc. The second column is urban population. The third column is rural population, and we all know what rural means now, right? Rural is a scale. The fewer tar roads, the fewer jobs, and less English, the more it becomes rural. What percentage is it of the whole world? Someone tell me, what percentage of the whole world was rural in 2015? Carson? Speak it loud. We can't even hear you. 46%. That means roughly one out of two. Over the whole world, including China, India, South America, America, Canada, here in Africa, the islands, Australia, roughly one out of two. We're living in rural areas around the whole world. But let's get more specific, right, to our neck of the woods. Africa, 60%. That was six years ago. Three out of five in Africa were in rural areas. Look down, Eastern Africa, 74%. Western Africa, 55%. Central African Republic, 60%. Central African Republic, 60%, 59%. Zambia, 67. Angola, 60, 56. And look at South Africa. What percentage of South Africa? You say, well, it's only 35. That's only one out of three. That's lower than the average. Yes, but look at the numbers. Remember those 
many, many decades of unfiltered immigration. They're all coming in here because it's the richest country on the continent. They're all coming in here, right? In the areas I minister, there are Somalis who have spaza shops. Somalians and Ethiopians, many of them. 35%, but look at what 35% amounts to. Let's round it up. 19 million in the rural areas. Do you follow that number? Bottom column, rural pop, sorry, bottom line of rural population 2015, South Africa, 18.8 .8 million. Let's call it 19 million. Look at the total population of Zimbabwe, 14 million. There are more people in the rural areas of this country than there are in Zimbabwe entirely. There are more people in the rural areas of this country than in all of Zambia entirely. In fact, 23 countries out of 54 have a smaller population than simply the rural areas of this country. My point is this, and I close. Do we have compassion for people who call themselves Christians but have not changed their worldview, they've only changed the bumper sticker on their car or on their house. They often put bumper stickers on their house because many people don't have cars in the rural areas that don't have tar roads and jobs. They haven't changed their religion. They still have what Peter said. They still have a useless way of life. And it's evident from the more immorality. It's evident from the lack of beauty. It's evident from the poverty. It's evident from the complete ignorance about the Christian religion. When you go to pray, pray that God Almighty would send Christ as the warrior pictured in Isaiah to come back and throw down his enemies and put his feet on their neck and crush them and pray that his servants, how weak and poor and prayerless, how cold we are. And oh, I fear that a blessing in our ministry would be a sanctioning sometime of our sins. But oh, pray that God would bless us. Pray that he would send Timothy. Pray that he would send your sons. Pray that he would send your money and that this church would be a marvel to all the churches in the ABK. That they would say, what's happening in Kempton Park? You gave more than a million rand to reach unreached people groups in the rural areas. What did you do for Mozambique? You sent out three missionaries from your church. Did you know that the Moravians in the 1700s, the Germans in the Moravian settlement of Herrnhut had a church of about 600 over 10 years? They sent out 70 missionaries. 70, that's more than 10% of their whole church. What's 10% of this church? To be sent out as missionaries to reach Mpumalanga, to go to places, and it's wonderful to go to Peru, but who's going to have compassion to say, you know what, there are people not far from me in the second world of my country. You know very well this area. And you know the road to Peter Maritzburg. And you know you've been down to Kimberley and Bloemfontein and Paris. But do you know about the rural areas? It's going to require learning the language. It's going to require fasting and prayer. It's going to require really a lifelong commitment. Because unless God sends a miracle, it's going to take a long time. I've been there 16 and a half years. I've seen one church. We've, we've got about seven that we're helping to work, but they're not completely selfish yet. There's one church between Paul and I that's selfish. It's a long, hard road. But pray that God would make you strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, and that you would put on the whole armor of God, and that you would stand against the evil one. I'll tell you, that is the way I pray for my boys. Not that they would go back to America and be rich, come here to Joburg, but that God would send them to Mozambique and to Malawi and to the Comoros where it's 99.9% .9 Muslim. Half a million people. 99.9% .9 Muslim. Brothers and sisters, let us lift up our eyes and look on the fields. They're white already to harvest. And may God answer our prayers and answer your prayers for the blessing of God in the unreached places, in the rural places. For Christ's sake, let's close in prayer. Oh, Holy Father, do in our hearts what only you can do. Spirit of God, we come to you in prayer and say to us, forgive us our sins that we would not grieve you anymore, that we would pray in faith, that we would lay up our treasures in heaven and not on earth, 
and take our sons and take our daughters and use them, we pray. Use them to bring precious sinners to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.